Hi and welcome. My name is Jordan Burdine and I am a pediatric and neonatal clinical pharmacy specialist at UTMB Health in Galveston, Texas. In my practice, I work as part of an interdisciplinary team and one of my roles within this team is to optimize my patient's nutrition. So today we will be discussing proteins, carbs, and fat in this total parental nutrition overview. And hopefully you find this overview helpful as you venture into your rotations as well as your future practice. Now, regardless of whether you practice in pediatrics or adults, all people need nutrition to live. Sometimes a person cannot eat or en enough or any food at all because of an illness or complication associated with their gastrointestinal tract. When this occurs and you are unable to eat, nutrition must be supplied in a different way. And one of the most common ways that we do that in the healthcare profession is through parenteral nutrition or intravenous nutrition, so administered through your veins. Throughout this presentation today, I will review the multiple components which make up total parenteral nutrition, or TPN, as well as discuss the TPN dosing strategies in neonatal and pediatric, as well as even adult patients. Who receives parenteral nutrition? Really, people of all ages can receive parenteral nutrition. They can live on this for a very long time or as short a time as needed. Many times we do prefer to use it for a short period of time due to the risk associated with long-term TPN, However, if they cannot begin to eat normally, we can continue this as long as they may need. Some instances in which we use parenteral nutrition to provide nutrition is in neonatal pediatrics who may be long-term NPO status, have failure to thrive, prematurity, or even have short gut complications. Adult patients can also use this for things like paralytic, paralytic ileus as well as small bowel obstruction and GI fistulas. But how does TPN provide all the nutrition these patients need? To meet the patient's nutritional goals, TPN must include a mixture of macro and micronutrients. As depicted here, macronutrients include proteins or amino acids, dextrose, and lipids or fat. Dextrose are utilized for energy, while proteins function as a structural substance in the generation of cell and tissue components. And lipids can do both of these within the body. Micronutrients include vitamins, trace elements, and electrolytes. They support metabolic activity such as enzymatic reactions, fluid balance, and even nerve conduction processes. When all three of the macronutrients, amino acids, dextrose, or dextrose, and lipids are included in one TPN, this is called a three-in-one TPN. However, when you separate the lipid component out, you have a two-in-one TPN, and this is often utilized in neonatal and pediatric patients. So let's look specifically more at the individual macronutrients that are included in a TPN. Protein or amino acid solutions are available in a wide range of concentrations, ranging from 3.5 to 15%. Each gram of protein provides four calories. In young patients especially, amino acids are critical and early initiation can decrease protein catabolism as well as enhance, enhance net protein accretion. Dextrose provides a source of carbohydrates and is a major source of calories for energy production in the parenteral nutrition formulations. One gram of dextrose yields 3.4 calories. Dextrose solutions are also available like amino acids in a very a varied amount of concentrations ranging up to 70%, and depending on the patient's glucose levels and line axis, we can customize the percent of dextrose we infuse. When writing TPNs or checking TPNs, you may see the amount of dextrose given expressed in a rate of milligrams per kilo per minute. This is called the GIR or glucose infusion rate. Our last macronutrient is fat or otherwise refers, referred to as lipids. These provide a concentrated source of calories and essential fatty acids and are easy to administer due to their low osmolarity. Several lipid emulsions are now available in the United States, including soybean, mixed lipid emulsions, which have a combination of different types of lipid oils, and fish oil. Although soybean oil is most commonly utilized, it is pro-inflammatory, so with long-term use in patients, they may develop TPN-induced cholestasis or parenteral nutrition-associated liver disease, and this may require us to use alternate formulations in these patients. Fats typically support about 30% of the non-protein calories and equal 10 calories per every one gram. 
Now, although we try to eliminate the fats in our diets, it's essential that in patients who are on PDPN that they get the essential fatty acids that are needed by the body for many important functions, including platelet functions and even wound healing. So now that we've evaluated the role of the macronutrients, let's look at some of our macro, micronutrients that are included within our TPN products. Of these, some of the most important may be our electrolytes. The principal electrolytes in parenteral nutrition formulations are sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, chloride, and acetate. These are essential for many cellular functions such as acid-base balance and nerve conduction. It's important to identify and correct deficiencies before initiating therapy. They may also be used in formulations to maintain normal serum concentrations or even correct ongoing losses. Trace elements such as zinc, copper, and manganese are also essential for parenteral nutrition. Some institutions may administer these separately as combination products or individually based on the patient's individual needs, and drug shortage often complicate this process as well. It's important to know when you may need additional amounts or even need to omit some of these products depending on the patient's clinical condition. For example, if you have a patient with poor hepatic function, you may want to consider limiting or omitting the copper component. When compiling the individual components of a, components within a TPN, there may be great variation depending on the individual patient. Depending on their age, as well as their nutritional needs, you have to customize to meet their goals. It's important to customize these amounts in order to make sure that they get the best optimized care possible. Here in this chart, I've broken down the individual volumes and caloric needs of the patients depending on their age. Now, it is important to keep in mind that these may vary somewhat depending on the patient's clinical condition. For example, if you have a burn patient, the caloric goal may be increased. In general, however, the overall amount of volume and calories per kilo will be greater the younger the patient is. And that's just a good rule of thumb. There are also administration considerations we must consider when administering parental nutrition. Within giving parental nutrition, you have to be concerned and calculate the osmolarity of the solution. Up to 900 millimol osmos per liter can be safely infused peripherally. Beyond 900 millimol milliosmoles per liter, the solution is recommended to be given through a central line. We also must be mindful of ingredients that do not play well together. For example, calcium and FOS must be given in specific amounts and even added to the bag at specific times to prevent precipitation. Changing other components like the amount of amino acids, overall pH, and even the temperature of the TPN can cause the molecules to precipitate. We also must be aware of the lines that the TPNs are infusing in, not just from an osmolarity standpoint, but also because these TPNs are considered high-risk medications as they contain high concentrations of critical medications like heparin and potassium, so they need double checks in place. Finally, we also must monitor our infusion sites to ensure that we do not have infiltrations. And as you can see depicted here in this picture, there was an infiltration where the TPN was infusing in this neonate's foot. So it's very important to maintain these high-risk medications and make sure they're infusing properly. Of course, as pharmacists, we also must be concerned about monitoring our patients. Due to the ingredients contained, like the many electrolytes, as well as lipids, amino acids, and dextrose, it's essential to monitor patients not only using a com complete metabolic panel to keep track of things like sodium and potassium, but also look at their renal function and hepatic function to see if we may need to limit or increase certain components. We also want to make sure that based on the condition they have and their age, we're giving them the proper amount of calories they need to heal and grow. So what if you have a patient with TPN? Aspen or the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition have many guidelines that are specific to certain patient populations and even certain disease states within those populations. And this is really the leading source of 